Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember this information, it is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur, building a balsa wood plane. And I'll be taking pictures of it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And getting a bit wet. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Now this is the 101st film review, uh, a momentous occasion for many reasons. And I think to celebrate, um, we needed to bring in some specialists. Now, they have said that if we brought them on the show, they would not only bring martinis, which we'll need, but some mayhem too. And I, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that. And also what they're bringing to the table is intelligence, which something you, know, you guys will know for the last two years we sorely lack. Um, so without further ado, our guests this week for our review, it is Jason and Ben from the Central Intelligence Cinema Podcast. Hello, gentlemen. How are you both doing? Hey, how's it going? Very well. Very well. So I think before we talk about this week's film and before we talk about Central Intelligence Cinema Podcast, let's talk a little bit about both of you. Now, of course, your podcast covers spy movies much like ours. We are both out there sharing the love for espionage cinema. But what I want to know from you both is where did that love come from? So perhaps, Ben, you first. Where did you first get into spy flicks? Uh, Well, for me, just being sort of a a kid of the 80s and uh, a latchkey kid at that, you know, I watched tons and tons of action movies and and um, Bond was certainly a, a big name back then, at least for me as a kid. And they were easily accessible. They were always on TV. And my mom took me to see Octopussy. That was the first one I saw in in the theaters. Um, probably the first Bond movie I saw on TV was The Spy Who Loved Me, which is still way up on my list as far as uh, favorite spy movies. But it just kind of started with with all that and, you know, just really being into action movies of the 80s. Um, it just kept sort of carried on from there. And and uh, I think when, you know, so it really all started with Bond, I guess. And then just sort of as Mission Impossible came in and, and uh, that sort of thing um, just sort of uh, grew and grew. And then as I got older, I <laughs> just started collecting stuff on top of everything else. And here we are. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to turn up completely covered in oil <laughs> like the lady from Quantum of Solace, but you've really uh, really doubled down on it, so I appreciate that. I worked out for like three weeks to get this shape. So. Hey, man, it shows. You're looking great. You're looking great. <laughs> I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, well, you know, what about you, Jason? Where did the love for spy cinema come from? Uh, well, you know, I've always been kind of an, an action movie kind of guy, although I, I tend to lean more towards the uh, laser guns and spaceships necessarily than spy uh, action movies. But uh, my grandmother um, was quite a huge James Bond fan. I don't know if it was kind of a closet thing that she shared only with me or everybody else knew about it, but no one in the family acknowledged it. Both are entirely possible. Um, but I remember spending Sunday evenings with her watching James Bond movies on the the Sunday movie on ABC um, and her making a specific point of us watching those films rather than maybe anything else that was on at any other point in time. And so um, I I think that was kind of my introduction into the idea of the spy movie. Um, You know, she took me to go see uh, both Octopussy and Never Say Never Again um, when they came out in the summer, I think of 83. Um, And, you know, we just sort of had a very, we had kind of a, a standoffish relationship uh, as far as grandparent to grandchild, but one of the things we bonded over with was James Bond movies and other forms of cinema. And so that kind of had a place that was near and dear in my heart, but uh, I sort of circled out of spy movies as I got a little bit older out of high school um, and kind of circled full back in towards the nineties with mission impossible, which is also a show that I watch with my grandmother over the summers. Um, and that sort of got me back interested in it because I think spy movies have kind of elevated themselves beyond sort of a second string cinema experience and was turning out good things in other genre stuff other than James Bond. 
I have a question for you. You talk about, you know, discovering Roger Moore Bond films with your grandma, but also saying you're more into, like, laser guns and spaceships. <laughs> is this a Moonraker question? Yes. Uh, is Moonraker, like, the creme de la creme of Bond for you, or...? Moonraker is not the creme de la creme of anything, let alone Bond. But, um, hey, that pre-title sequence is pretty. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell That's you, it's the, saying. it's the first Bond movie I saw in the theaters. Right. But I saw that with my mom, not my grandmother, um, probably because I was like, laser guns, let's go there. Uh, but no, it is definitely not. Um, I certainly... I enjoy it for the campiness of it. That's fair. Um, but it is definitely not the pinnacle of James Bond movies. <laughs> I recently I recently saw it on, on the big screen for the first time. And uh, seeing uh, the person pretending to be James Bond have his head buried into the ass of the person pretending to be Jaws was a moment <laughs> I will never forget. <laughs> and Scott became a man that day. <laughs> <laughs> Hairs on my chest were grown. <laughs> saw the world in a whole new way. <laughs> uh, yeah. 4K never looks so good. <laughs> but, um, so you both have a love of of James Bond, but you do a spy movie podcast. So let's let's talk about that. So how did the podcast come to be, and why not sort of the James Bond Avenue? Why sort of the wider scope like we have? Uh, well, you know, it it did start. It actually did sort of start with James Bond in a way because I was heavily heavily influenced by uh, the podcast uh, James Bond Radio. And just, I got way into that and it just got me thinking about, oh, I could, I could do something like that. But then, you know, there was, there's a lot of James Bond podcasts out there. And, and I started thinking about what, what's the crux of what I really like. And I, what I really like is all the spy movie stuff and the, and the secret agent uh, aspect of it. And, you know, so I, I did want to be able to cover Mission Impossible and some of those other things. And, and uh, around that same time, a mutual friend of, of Jason and I's, uh, who was kind of the reason why me and Jason became friends in the first place, he ended up moving quite a ways away from us. And I didn't want to lose track of Jason. And I was starting to feel kind of cooped up in the house and, and maybe too involved in my professional work. And so I need, I, I sort of, came up with it out of the need to like make sure that I don't didn't just become a hermit. And so one day on chat with with Jason, I was like, hey man, I got this really bad idea that I want you to be part of. And he's like, sign me up. Let's do this. Well I, I suppose like we've had a couple of other spy movie podcasts on the show. And and one question we like to ask is what's the weirdest thing you've sort of stumbled across so far in, in your shows, like lineage? Like we, we've found some very interesting films in our deep dives into spy movies, but I mean, what's the most like funny, interesting thing you found or a new favorite film you've, you've stumbled across? Hmm. I don't know if we've gone that far as far as finding super weird stuff. I mean, I, I watched, um, one of the OSS, uh, 117 movies and love that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know how weird it is, but it's funny as all get out. And and I probably never would have watched that if if I hadn't started the podcast. So I can assure you, I never would have watched Eye of the Needle if it hadn't been for this podcast. <laughs> That's true. That is very true. I don't think we would have done quite that deep of a dive. <laughs> I mean, we have we have executive veto powers, and I think I might have exercised my executive veto on that one. <laughs> Hey, now keep keep it keep it down. We don't know yet if we like it or not. Let's we'll, we'll get there. But sorry, I, sorry. Usually, sorry. no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Usually, Cam, I would set you up with just like, a, hey, Cam, what are we doing this week? But you know, I I wanted to really sort of sell it what we're doing this week because you know, I alluded to it. Earlier, this is one hundred and one. We've just come off of an episode covering the namesake of this podcast, Spy Hard, and an interview with a director. And then the next week, finding the best film on the knock list and then following it up with an interview with Miriam Darbo herself. And the day this episode drops, the day is my birthday. Uh, that's right. So how are we celebrating this momentous occasion, Cam? We are celebrating your birthday, Scott, with 1981's Eye of the Needle starring Donald Sutherland. 
I couldn't think of a more spy hard thing to do than to uh, build all that momentum and then thoroughly take our legs out by talking about this film. Oh, we may have some split opinions here. Mm. Okay, 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 okay. Well, for those of you who do not know or have never heard of this film, which could well be a lot of you, here is your letterbox.com synopsis. Eye of the needle. To love a stranger is easy. To kill a lover is not. Great Britain, 1944, during World War II. Relentlessly pursued by several MI5 agents, Henry Faber, the needle, a ruthless German spy in possession of vital information about D-Day, takes refuge on Storm Island, an inhospitable, sparsely inhabited island off the coast of northern Scotland. Damn right. Dum dum dum. Mm. <laughs> Drama builds. It all escalates. <laughs> now, I'd never heard of this film. I don't think anyone else has, but uh, does anyone in the room have any connection to this film whatsoever? Um, I'd only heard of it because actually when we started this podcast, it was one of the first movies my mom ever asked, when are you going to do Eye of the Needle? And so I was like, oh, okay. So I knew that there was um, sort of you know interest out there for us to cover Eye of the Needle. That's about as far as it goes. Well, that's, that's, that's one download. That's, mm, uh, that's right. Great. <laughs> and then us four will download it and we've hit five well done everyone i think you are underestimating the appeal of this one i really do okay all right all right cam it sounds like you've got some info for us but i i assume that's the same for, for ben and jason there no, no connection to this film whatsoever nope no, I I, in fact i think i confuse a lot of this with uh the eagle has landed mm-hmm. um and I think I was thinking that this was that movie, and it was not. Yeah, there's definitely some connections to that film uh, and a couple of other spy films I've, I've written down here in my notes. But um, before we get to our thoughts on Eye of the Needle, Cam, what can you tell us about how we got that needle in our eye? <laughs> so Eye of the Needle is, despite not being really that old, there's not a lot online in terms of production notes on this one. Um, but uh, it was based on a Ken Follett uh, novel. Uh, Ken Follett was, you know, he, and is a hugely popular British thriller and historical um, fiction writer. Um, he's sold up to, I think, 160 million copies. And he's, you know, produced some books like Key to Rebecca, Edge of Eternity, World Without End. Hugely acclaimed. Have, has anyone here ever read any of his novels? No, I have not, actually. No? I, 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 I never read books. I have never read one of his books, but when I was, you know, a young, younger kid, my parents, we would go up to a summer home that my grandparents owned. And if you looked at the bookshelves, it was lined with his novels. So that's how I was kind of aware of his name. Not so much having read any of them. Having done my research about the chap, he strikes me or his books strike me as the sort of thing my brother would read. Who He read a lot of sort of war history books and sort of you know stories made up within those times of strife so i wouldn't be surprised if my brother had read this and so there were probably were some lying around the house right and eye of the needle was his big breakthrough novel it was published in 1978 it became an instant international bestseller and sold over 10 million copies and that obviously had hollywood very eager to snap it up and so just a couple years later they you know grabbed it and got it going and they hired stanley mann who was a toronto born um, screenwriter who'd started in TV in the 1950s, in the early 50s, before moving into film with 1958's Lana Turner film, Another Time, Another Place. And he was one of these guys, you look at his filmography, there's a few titles that pop out. He was not like, you know, kind of one of the top tier guys, but a very reliable studio writer. He wrote some stuff like the Frank Sinatra spy film, The Naked Runner. Um, he also wrote Damien, Omen 2, uh, the horror sequel. And he also wrote 1979's Meteor, the disaster film co-starring Sean Connery. Of course, everyone's favorite disaster film. <laughs> it was not. It was a disaster film in many ways, Scott. Not just ah. the description of the genre. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 79 was definitely known as the peak of Connery. So. Yeah, so he basically um, worked on Meteor and then rolled right into Eye of the Needle. And he would go on and do a couple of things. This was near the end of his career. He would basically close it out with things like Firestarter and um, Conan the Destroyer. And the director, Richard Marquand, 
who, to anyone, you know, in kind of my generation, we instantly know that name. Why is it? Someone say it. Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi. Yep. I grew up, obviously knew that name at a very young age, and had never seen anything else he'd really done. Um, there's, I think, one other thing I might have seen, but not much. Not much at all. Is this man responsible for the Ewoks? No, that's George Lucas. Yeah, yeah, okay. George Lucas for sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't have it in for him already. Then that's fine. <laughs> so Marcand was a Welsh-born um, producer director who started off in documentaries, mostly for TV, before moving into TV series and TV films. And he made his motion picture debut in 1978 with the film The Legacy, which was a horror vehicle starring Sam Elliott and Catherine Ross, which doesn't seem to have had the best of reception if you look at some of these scores online. And then he also did a 1979 Beatles biopic called Birth of the Beatles that I think has been mostly lost to the sands of time. It's not one I've seen, and I would call myself a Beatles aficionado, so no. Yeah, and then he rolled right into Eye of the Needle from there. And Eye of the Needle actually was the movie that got him Return of the Jedi. George Lucas was so impressed with this film that he felt like that was who he wanted to take the reins on that third Star Wars film. I wonder what scene it was that made him think, yes, this is my man. <laughs> um, it's tough to say because it's not, it's not action heavy. I, I would say it's probably the thriller aspects in the back half. That's my guess. I was going to say. The motorcycle scene across the bridge, very indicative of the speeder bike chase throughout the forest. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Sure. And this film reunited Donald Sutherland with Kate Nelligan. They had previously worked together on a 1977 TV movie called Bethune, or Bethune, about a Canadian doctor who dedicated himself to hum humanitarian causes. It was a biopic tv movie i have not seen this uh i'm sure it's out there somewhere for someone who wants to track that down and um i had an interesting quote from kate nelligan where they talked to her the interview was sort of framed around eye of the needle but they didn't actually talk about eye of the needle they were more talking about her career and where she was at this early point and i wanted some uh thoughts from scott on this because she was born in canada and mm -hmm. studied drama in england and she said this is a quote from her I knew if I was going to work, I'd better find myself an absolutely ironclad British accent. And I was curious. I want some critiques from Scott. Like, how did it hold up to you? I had no question about her accent throughout. It was Donald Sutherland I sort of rubbed <laughs> yeah, up we, against. Yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, just mm, just a smidge. Not as bad as I had the needle. But um, yeah, hers, I, I, I know what this afterwards. I've done some reading and knew she was not from Britain. But yeah. I, I think she sold it perfectly. Whereabouts in Britain does that accent sort of originate from? Like, does it jump out to you? Pass. It's it's like an it's like an amalgam of different things. She's she doesn't sound like she's from London, which is where she's portrayed. Because in the in the beginning, she's all very like, oh, mummy, oh mm. dear, oh, she's very like gentry, hoity toity. And then later on, when she's living up in in the Storm Islands, islands uh, she has more of a twang, but that might just be living out in the countryside with old drunk Tom. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the production seems to have been pretty easy on this one. Um, apparently, the studio did recut the film, and um, the preferred cut of the movie was released on Blu-ray, the BFI edition of the Blu-ray. Um, so that was the version Macond Mar um, signed off on. It also had a slightly altered ending, um, but yeah, I couldn't find the ending online. I really want to watch it on YouTube or anything, but I saw descriptions and they just seemed very, very minor. It was a little, a little more of a happy ending versus slightly ambiguous. Yeah. The, the version I watched was very much an ambiguous ending. I think, I think we probably all saw the same version. I think the, um, alternate is like a few seconds longer. It's more like the chopper coming down and greeting her sort of stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. wow. No. Hmm. It's not like alternate footage. It's not like the salt various endings or anything. Right. Okay. Fair mm -hmm. enough. And um, so I couldn't find a budget on this. Um, domestically, it made $17.6 million. Could not find international numbers on this one. And they said in the, uh, the Kate Nelligan interview, this was not a success. So that's how I'm determining that this movie, probably its budget was close enough to $17.6 million that they walked away saying it wasn't quite a success. Okay. Uh, I... I'll reserve judgment at this point. Uh, there is, 
it at times does feel like a TV movie. I will just say that. Like I think that maybe the budget, like I don't think there was a lot of money to spend on this film. I feel like it was very cheaply done. Yeah, I would think so. You wouldn't need a lot yeah. of money to make this movie. Um, no. It was number 42 for the year at the worldwide box office um, between the howling and take this job and shove it. <laughs> <laughs> do we, do we, do we rename this episode to take this needle and shove it in your eye? <laughs> I looked up what Take This Job and Shove It is. It's a Robert Hayes um, comedy vehicle. So this was, I guess, post-airplane. One of his uh, few attempts oh, at stardom. Right before he jumped into trench coat and ruined everything about spy movies for the next 10 years. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it seems like it's like kind of brewery-themed. So I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> at, least it's not, at least there's no airplane in this film. The last, the only two films I've ever seen him in, he's in an airplane at least one point. I think he just has a, a three films. So airplane two, he's also in an airplane. So yeah, I, the, the thing has, this guy has a thing for it. Maybe, maybe Robert Hayes designed this whole cardboard island. Oh, good mm. call. That would have been a cameo that really would have jumped out at me. Yeah. <laughs> he just, just sat in a fake cockpit like, <laughs> ah, it's not flying, we're going to crash. <laughs> If they had him and Leslie Nielsen on the construction crew building those planes, home run. You want me to build what? Surely you can't be serious. <laughs> and uh, the top three for this year, number one was Raiders of the Lost Ark, number two was On Golden Pond, and number three was Superman 2. Notably, number eight was For Your Eyes Only. And the only other kind of postscript I had on this was just the director, Richard Marcond. You know, he does Return of the Jedi. And then he only made three films after that, um, Until September, Jagged Edge, and Hearts of Fire. Jagged Edge being the only one I'd really heard of, which is a uh, Jeff Bridges film. Um, he died of a stroke at age 49 on September 4th, 1987. So, had a fairly short life. And yeah, not a huge filmography, but Return of the Jedi. You only need one to be remembered forever, right? Right. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how it sticks out. I mean, I, I don't recognize the name myself, but I never considered myself a massive Star Wars fan. But all three of you knew... The name instantaneously, so the legend lives on. Well, it was always this huge question mark because, like, Irvin Kershner, you would see his name pop up on things, and he did Empire Strikes Back, you know, Robocop 2, and Never Seen Ever Again. So I would see his name. I never saw Richard Marcand on, like, anything. And there was, like, there was rumors that George Lucas kind of ghost-directed Return of the Jedi as well. So no one's really known what happened with Return. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, Cam, do you have anything else for us? No, that wraps up the behind the scenes on Eye of the Needle. Well, gents, I think it's about time we talk about the film. The film that I think inspired the scene in Flashdance where she has water thrown all over herself. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you chuck buckets of water at Donald Sutherland? The film. Let's find out. <laughs> um, well, guests always go first. Let's go Jason first. What did you think your top line review of the Eye of the Needle? Uh, well, you know, I think it was a perfectly adequate early 80s suspense thriller with a spy thing. <laughs> well, that's about us, folks, everywhere. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Good night, on, everybody. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tip your waitresses. <laughs> no, it, it, to be fair, like it, it, to some, it probably won't inspire anything else than that. It, I read some IMDb reviews, and they were pretty much two line reviews and five out of ten star. Like that, that middle of the road take on it seems fairly I mean Roger Ebert gave it three stars I think mm -hmm. yeah wasn't wasn't particularly impressed it was well shot but there weren't any particular scenes that wowed me um it was easy to follow the narrative was good I thought it was well paced you know but uh it wasn't engaging at the level that I kind of expected that it would be I mean I was I was hooked mostly on what was going to happen to the two sheep <laughs> far more engaging. i genuinely i genuinely wanted to know what the mother did with them that i i i was left hanging and i was hoping for like a post credit scene nothing nothing at all that's the movie i want to see is what happens yeah. when she gets home with those sheep what the hell does she do with those things man that's a whole other spin <laughs> is it is it spy related is someone chucking buckets of water we don't know we just don't know that would then be called the eel of the needle Oh, oh. Yeah. I'll see. Wow. I'll see myself Boom. out. I'll see myself. Yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> we're not. We're not topping that one. We are not topping that one. Um, Cam, we'll go with you next. What do you think? 
I actually really enjoyed this one. Um, it definitely took some time to settle in. It is a very slow burn movie. And I was sitting through the first hour or so watching Donald Sutherland sort of evade capture. And it felt a little like um, Day of the Jackal, where it's clearly, you know, mm -hmm. an yeah. enemy agent that is dodging authorities. And I was a little, I guess, frustrated by the um the portrayal of the you know the um british trying to capture him where it felt like very thin mm -hmm. and i was like well with like day of the jackal you really got a sense of that procedural we are hunting him so you got that kind of cat and mouse game being played out whereas here it was like it felt a little middle of the road kind of stuff i think for me where the movie really turned was when he showed up with um you know and and was taken in by that family after he was injured and to me, that stuff really worked. I thought that like the move, the first hour of the film did a pretty solid job, actually, in retrospect, of setting up how dangerous he was, how completely like just cold and uh, self interested this character was, and so I didn't quite know where the movie was going to go. I actually had a lot of predictions when he showed up with the family of how this movie was going to play out. You know, I thought we've got this husband who's you know confined to a wheelchair. He is going to find the strength to take this guy down and this family will be happy when the movie ends. And that's not what the movie did at all. It went in directions I didn't expect. And so when it got to kind of the end, I think the thriller aspects maybe feel a little dated now. But I think like at the time they would have felt a little more, um, you know, I thought of like Wait Until Dark with Audrey Hepburn a couple times when I was watching it. It had just this very kind of like dark, sinister undertone that I thought really worked when you cast Donald Sutherland. I think he just brings a lot to that type of character. So this is to me like it's not a, you know, home run movie, but I thought it was really solid. It's interesting that you found a lot of love in that later section. Um I mean, I won't get into my thoughts just yet. I'm going to go to bed next. But like, I, I struggled in the later section. I found the earlier bits a lot more interesting where it was like a spy on the run fighting for his life. I wanted more of the espionage and him discovering these wooden planes and you know, killing the home guard and things like that. That that was interesting. When it got to the melodrama of the island, it just felt like it was very sleepy for me. After, after once the storm hit, basically. But uh, right, Ben, what about you? Well, I actually thought it kind of felt like two separate movies sort of jammed together, and and one of them was paced much better than the other. the The first movie was the movie that I wanted to see more. So in that respect, I, I agree with Scott. Um, but I felt like the second movie was executed better. And so in that respect, I enjoyed the second half more as far as simply for the fact that the pacing was better. I found myself getting bored, <laughs> to be quite honest, in the, in the first movie, just because the chase was so, it was just a slog. Watching this chase happen, it, it didn't feel... Um, they didn't push it hard enough. And I think they, maybe they, they put all their stock in the last 30 minutes of the movie. And so, and so you end up with, uh, you just sort of, I, you know, I, I definitely agree. Like I, I either need to see one of these movies or the other movie, but I, when you put them together, it's, it was sort of strange. It felt like, I agree. Like there was a real lack of, tension and momentum to that first half and it just needed like i don't know like the character who's pursuing him to be perhaps better portrayed because like i don't even know who the guy hunting him was i mean it was some dude but like that was not a character and i think that really would have maybe amped up the tension in that first half yeah um because by the time he goes and joins the family i'm happy to settle in for that movie I don't even care about what's going on with the hunt for him. Whereas I feel like I should feel that sort of hanging over his desperation in the second half. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Just because they, there was better chemistry. There was, well, there was people to play off of each other. Whereas in the first half, it's really just, you're really just following Donald Sutherland around. And there's, there's very little, I would agree. There's, there's no hero because you're following the villain the entire movie. And you're not, you never see like a solid hero type character who's leading the charge to try and find the the needle. He's just sort of doing his thing, but no one's ever getting even remotely close to catching him. Whereas everything sort of builds 
once once he gets to the island, things actually begin to build and the tension begins to mount. And suddenly you start feeling it a little bit more. Um, topically wise, I would like I said, I mean, I was actually more interested in in you know what he was doing as far as the spy craft goes, um, rather than when it evolves into this sort of romantic thriller, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you know I I want to see the spy side of it more. I I completely get what you're saying. Like it perhaps is a bit muddy that first half, and 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 it's it's definitely not as tense. You the comparison to Day of the Jackal is correct. So I wrote it down in my notes. And you haven't got that Michael Lonsdale character breathing down your neck the whole time, and and you're watching him investigate the jackal whilst the jackal is out doing jackal business. Whereas you just got the needle, needle in people, which is great and cool <laughs> to see. It very like that's a cool looking weapon, man. That is a, yeah. a distinctive thing that you'll remember from this film. I I think is the needle attacks. Yes, that's the only image I think I'll have apart from the water, the stiletto or whatever it's called. Sure. Um, but there was the point early on where they go and pick up like that young soldier who knew who he was. Mm. The guy they get to pick him out of like a lineup, you know, like in these photographs. And I'm like, boy, it would be tough to pick someone out of a photograph from those from that era where it's like everyone looks the same in the photos. Right. Right. But nonetheless, <laughs> they go and pick up that guy. And I'm like, OK, clearly this is the guy who's going to be tied into the investigation. And then he's never really mentioned again. Yeah. And then there's that guy, Billy, we meet off the top who wants to join the war. He shows up later investigating him and is very quickly dispatched. I'm like, you know, those were people that felt like they were set up to actually perhaps play a role in the hunt because that mm-hmm. at least is a face, someone we could actually attach something to. And then and then the second half of the film, you've got, I mean, like, it, it's basically an evolution of what would happen if the character in the 39 Steps stayed on the farm with the crofter's wife and mm-hmm. followed that plot through further. Yeah. It's on a Scottish moor. She's in love with him and is mistreated by the husband. It's kind of a retelling of a very old story in that sense. And and that's really interesting. I just I just couldn't stand the romance side of things. I, I completely get being like the feeling of her feeling lost and, and not seen by her husband. I, I completely get that and, and finding solace in a stranger. Totally understand it. But like I wanted more of that sort of high stakes espionage, this, this spy on the run trying to get this intel back to Germany. I didn't feel it when the island happened. It felt very uh, stationary at that point, whereas it felt like there was a bit more of a kinetic motion when he was traveling England because he was literally moving to a place. Whereas when he's on the island, I, the, I know there's a U-boat out there wanting to get him, but really it's just about the three of them on the island, four of them, sorry, with a child, just jockeying for control. And there is something pretty um, <laughs> like huge about his mission. I mean, it's going to be revealing the D-Day plans and he has like evidence that could thwart the Normandy landing. And it's like, that's pretty big stakes. Mm-hmm. That's really big. And, you know, we in the audience know, of course, he's not going to succeed. But like, you want a little more sense of the character actively pushing to achieve this goal. Like, he's really taking it easy at points. Like, he kind of settles into this romance with, you know, Kate Nelligan's character where I'm like, okay, like that's why I think I was drawn more into the thriller aspect because it felt more committed to the thriller stuff versus like the spy stuff, maybe a little less so. Uh, it, it just feels like there are no stakes until the very end of the film. And it it's almost like, well, we want to make this sort of romance romance movie, this lifetime movie. You know, and we want to throw it in with this. We're just going to cram them together and see what we can get. But the emphasis was to get everything to the romance part rather than maybe the romance being the emphasis to get us to the spy part. Tying into that beautifully, actually, I was reading about the book online and the actual original story. In the, the book story, there's a lot more spent on the espionage. And then the love story is kind of like the back nine not even the back nine, that's like half, but like, I don't know, the the last third of the film or the book is about that love story and him being trapped on the island. And and I know I'm butchering it. And I can hear everyone at Spybury throwing things at me again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's interesting that they like, they focused on the love story. That's what they wanted to hang their hat on instead of the espionage, whereas the book is more about the needle and the needle on a mission to try and thwart the D-Day landings. And, and maybe that's what I wanted to see more of, but I, I can see why people with Cam obviously enjoyed the other side of it. I completely understand that too. But um, I think what we need to do now is things talk about things that we liked. 
So guests are always first. Let's go with you, Ben, first. Something you liked about the film. Um, I thought Donald Sutherland himself was, was, I liked him, despite the fact that his accent was pretty bad but but aside bad. From, I, th- I thought it was magnificent <laughs> for a, a canadian a canadian playing a german playing a, a brit you know what could go wrong um, Who, whose voice um, is being commented on by a canadian yes yeah <laughs> so and i like that they dubbed him when he was speaking german as well right yeah <laughs> but i do feel like he did play he did give the character a lot of personality i mean he's so just almost psychopathic or or mm-hmm. you know especially when there's that scene where they're at that little cave um the needle and and lucy are in that cave and and he's i'm guessing just making up this story as he goes about what he's quote unquote writing and he talks about how he how he ends up uh, killing the woman that he loves because she broke his heart. Like he's so convincing as this sociopathic sort of guy who somehow thinks that that's romantic. And you just see her just (laughs) the disgust just sort of washes over her afterwards, but he sells that really well. And I think just in general, he does a really good job of just showing off that he is an incredibly crafty, guy and and that he you know he's clearly smarter than pretty much everybody in the room most of the time he's so good at uh, donald southern i should say he um is so good at showing that that sort of dead behind the eyes look and like going from like smiley to i'm about to murder you right in in a flash like that moment where the lady is dropping off tea he's like, <laughs> oh, I, I, i'm it, it's for the war effort stab <laughs> mm. <laughs> are you talking about the uh, oh the maid Yes. Who's like, I thought it was pretty funny, though, when he comes home and she's like, would you like a meat pie? And then there's like, they kind of linger on her um, saying that to him. And I'm like, is there something going on with these characters? Is this a, like a double entendre or something? It was very strange. <laughs> it's it's pretty clear that uh, Donald Sutherland is a sex bomb in this mm-hmm. film. And the ladies cannot get enough of Mr. <laughs> Wet Behind the Ear. <laughs> well... Needle by name, needle by nature, ladies. Hello there. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, double O. No, let's not get into that. Um, <laughs> that was a bit of a quandary for me. I was like, why, of all people, is Donald Sutherland the most desirable man in all of northern <laughs> northern UK? It just means that we've all got hope. That's all it means. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that was also the case, though, in um, in. Um, what's it called um the eagle has landed like mm-hmm. he yes. was also like the one given kind of the sweeping love story in that film as well there's something about donald sutherland when he heads overseas look out because the word yeah and he's one of those actors who i don't think he could play stupid if he tried like he just has like an intelligence like that just flickers in his eyes and i think it makes him that much more compelling here where he has to act often by himself there's always a sense that he's like working angles in his brain mm-hmm. and it makes the character seem dangerous in the same way Edward Fox did in Day of the Jackal. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Jason, what about you? Something you liked? Uh, I certainly liked uh, Kate and Elegant's performance. Um, I think she was kind of the glue that hold, held that whole second half of the film together. Um, not just in terms of being a good actress, but she was really selling some of the more subtle, uncomfortable portions, particularly at the end, uh, the love scene after she figures out everything that's going on, um, kind of that tension she has even at the end as she's very poorly trying to shoot her, albeit left-handed, I'll give her that. Um, but she still looked like she didn't want to do it, but had to do it at the same time. So there was that conflict in her right up to the very end of the film. And I think that between the two of them, they showed up every day, put in the work, did what they needed to do. And I feel like the majority of the rest of the cast sort of phoned it in, um, which I think maybe affects a lot of why the first half seems so lackluster. Just nobody seemed terribly invested in actually catching the needle. They just like saying the needle. 
Mummy, why is that man in my bed? <laughs> I, I, I think that kid was dubbed as well. I think so. Yes, I did the voice. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm pretty sure that was like a uh, grown woman voicing a child. I'm pretty oh, sure. Oh, thanks, Cam. Jesus. <laughs> You're welcome, Scott. <laughs> Happy birthday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, on on the 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 the, uh, the Kate Nelligan of it all, I completely agree. I I think that scene where they she's found out that or she suspects that he killed her husband and and they're making love and she feels very uncomfortable and it's clearly an emotion distressing moment. She sells that really well, and I loved seeing what I I now have dubbed the Skyfall defense of the barn where she borders it all up and grabs a shotgun. Mm-hmm. Um, very much a, a Daniel Craig move. So I can only assume that Daniel Craig's Bond was watching the Eye of the Needle during <laughs> Skyfall at some point. And thought, ah, that's what we'll do. <laughs> I can see why, you know, you're saying the book, like the back third of it was really that story. I can kind of see why they would beef that up for the movie. Um, because I think like if you cast Kate Nelligan, you want to layer in that story and spend more time developing it. Mm-hmm. Um and I think like this character is pretty tricky because you have to believe that she would stay with this, you know, husband who's horrible. <laughs> like he's just like the worst. And, you know, she kind of gets it across as sort of the sunk cost theory. It's like, well, I put in four years and I'm kind of like, four years? Is that it? <laughs> like, lady, wake up. That's how I feel after two years of podcasting with you. So. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> We're halfway there. <laughs> so like... You, she has to get that across as well as an instant attraction to Donald Sutherland. You have to buy that because like they are going at it after one day. And, you know, you have that scene, which I think is a very tricky scene where he walks in when she's in the bathtub with her child and they're both, you know, naked and whatever. And he walks in and just stands there and stares for a while. And you have to kind of get like within her kind of that fear and apprehension, but also sort of that like no one's looked at me that way because clearly the husband has not. That's been a big part of that character's journey. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's threatening, but you have to kind of buy that she would be curious about Donald Sutherland versus instantly freaked out because I think a lot of people would be instantly freaked out. And so like, I think if you had this material dealt with just a little differently or a different actress, perhaps it could have fallen really wrong. But I think Kate Nelligan really gets it across. Yeah, agreed. As part of the celebration for my birthday, um, Cam and I, when this episode drops, will be in Las Vegas together, actually, for the first time in many years, which it shall be glorious. I can only imagine Cam will be trying to reenact this scene in my bathroom <laughs> at some point. I, I will turn around and see him just staring into the mirror. And um, Pictures or it yeah. didn't happen. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, we'll see you on Patreon, folks. <laughs> and a lot of abdomen uh, caressing, yeah. as happens in this movie a lot. Yes, yes, lots of abdomens. Uh, well, Cam, what about you, something you liked? I would say the thriller aspects in the back half, which... Um, You know, you look at um, a movie like, say, Fatal Attraction from that decade, they start to amp it up more. When you see a thriller nowadays, it goes bigger. Whereas what I liked here was it's scary because there's a reality to the Donald Sutherland character and like a danger to him. But at the same time, like he doesn't really want to hurt her. It's like these two people who are in a thriller situation who still kind of have feelings for each other. And it's somewhat ambiguous. You know, at the end when he's saying, you know, it's come, the war has come down to just the two of us. You don't get the sense she really wants to shoot him. But it's like she's taken on the role of this is a German spy and I need to stop him. But there is that human part of her that had a connection with him. And so, like, to me, that made the thriller aspects really work, even if you compare them to a thriller nowadays and say, well, this seems a little more subdued than you're used to. I still thought it really packed a punch, especially when she's, like, taking an axe to his hand. A great moment. I thought that was great. It's definitely, it, it, there's a, a lot of psychological thriller. It's not, like, it's not really like a body horror thriller or anything like that. It's really a cerebral film in that, in that last part of the film. And I think that, that does work. It's not him, like, leaping through the windows and things like that, yeah. Here's Faber. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did think that a little bit on my first watching when he busts through the window of the door. It is actually perfectly framed. He's kind of like like he hangs his head through the door and everything. Yeah, right. Definitely shining vibes right there. <laughs> I'm posting that one online. Don't you worry about it. But, um, <laughs> I, I suppose like you guys have kind of covered all of my 
bits I liked really. I think everyone deserves a nod. Donald Sutherland, Kate Nelligan. Uh, I also think the score was really good in this. I think it's one of the only other likes I had mentioned. Uh, I should find a chap who did it really, but um, Cam could look that up for me whilst I'm talking. But yeah, th- you with me with scores. I don't tend to often notice them. So when I do, they're either really bad, like Sarah's and Goldeneye, or they're exceedingly good, like this one. Yeah, the score was done by Miklos Rosa, who, long career, and he did films like uh, Double Indemnity, El Cid, Spellbound. He worked on Ben-Hur. So this was definitely a uh, you know long-term Hollywood composer. That's probably why I liked it. I feel like they did a good job, too, of, of governing when they used the score and when they just played it dry, too. Because there's a couple moments where playing it dry actually, like, sort of amps up some of that drama, uh, especially on the back half. Although I do think it's really funny. I, I wanted to mention at some point, I thought it was funny how at the, towards the end of this movie, sort of talking again about how they sort of forget about the spy aspect of this movie, how it becomes this full on thriller after she t- takes out the electricity in, in the house that's got the radio and they're sitting there and they're like, well, I guess it's up to, you know, it's it's between us who wins the war or whatever like that. It was almost like they they're like, oh, I just remembered <laughs> this is this is also about spy stuff. We should probably get back to that now. It kind of it was almost like this wake up call of, of, of that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, and I think you're sort of straying towards some of the bits that don't work for me necessarily. So I think um, let's all put our pimple removing cream on. And, I have one uh, more like, one more like. Oh, Scott. Cam, you're killing me. I use my segue and everything. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I thought some of the uh, art direction was pretty impressive. Like, I did like that field of the balsa wood plains. I thought that was actually a really cool location. You wasted a beautiful segue for a balsa wood comment. <laughs> yes, that was a really awesome sequence, I thought. Happy birthday. Right, you, you can queue up the next section, Cam. Go on. Ah. <laughs> well, we are going to talk now. About the move, about the moments we didn't like. So, oh, whatever. <laughs> Scott's just like throwing up his head. I don't have any sort of puns. Okay, I got it. Something better. Okay, well, let's turn the dial like that World War Two radio we heard off the top, and and seg from the things we liked to the things we didn't. Beautiful. This is why you <laughs> thank you don't do the segways every week. Guests first. That's right. Let's go with Ben. Something you didn't like you haven't mentioned already. Uh, something haven't already mentioned um or, or or like delve into one you have a bit more there's there's just a lot of silly things in here like uh the character billy um how, <laughs> how he's like they, he's apparently too young to join the army but the the guy looks like he's like 30 something <laughs> and that he's like riding a bike it's gee Maybe someday I can join the army. You know, just excuse me, mate. You are you taking the Mickey out the British accent or what? <laughs> Jiminy Chillicas. Jiminy Chillicas. <laughs> so that that was a little silly for me. Um, here's a weird thing: um, the prosthetic leg of uh, David. This mm-hmm. this was so weird because. Um, at one point he says, well, I've lost my legs and then he's in the car and he has legs, but there's a scene, there's a quick scene of him going down the stairs and he has no legs, but it's yeah. very, it's, I, I was really struggling. Like, does he have legs or does he not have legs? And then finally when he's dead, I'm like, oh, okay. It's just a prosthetic. <laughs> like. It did give you one of the sort of most unintentionally funny moments where he is, uh, where David Rose, the character, is strangling Faber, the needle. And for a moment, he has the upper hand, and then Faber realizes, oh, I can lift this chap. And then just sort of ragdolls him off the side of the cliff. Anything with a ragdoll in a film <laughs> gets a thumbs up from me. I love ragdoll Pratt falls. Anything like that, it, yeah. Put it on the knock list, Cam. I don't care. Jeez. <laughs> that sequence was pretty tense. It that was fight between the it two. Worked. Of them. Yeah, I did find that that fight to be a little awkward. Like, come on, like there's there's no way that he would struggle 
that Donald Sutherland would struggle with fighting a cripple like for that long. Do you know what the funny bit was? Is when he had Donald Sutherland on his knees and then he goes, walk to me. And then so Donald Sutherland has to like waddle on his <laughs> knees. And I was like, this is, this is taking an agonizingly long time for him to get across this like two meter gap. Yeah. Well, it's like they want to create a suspenseful sequence, but it's tough to create a convincing situation where a well-trained spy like Donald Sullivan, who we've seen kill people one after another throughout the movie, would be like really hung up with this guy. Like, be like, oh, I, I just can't do it. I can't do it. This guy keeps beating me down. <laughs> yeah, this whole fight scene felt like the dumpster fight scene and They Live. Like it was just going on entirely too long. <laughs> and the two combatants were not really invested in it. <laughs> like, put on the glasses. Put on the glasses. Put on the glasses. <laughs> we interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game, requires considerable resources. Whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course, constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right. As you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Yes, Dirty Harry is live and we are finishing the Star Wars prequels with Revenge of the Sith. Hopefully it's more yes than no! And if that sounds delicious then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spy but before this message self-destructs cam resume the spy jinx what about you jason something you didn't like well you know i didn't like that they didn't have any closure with the people that were coming after donald sutherland and we get the scene we're all in the helicopter we're flying over we're gonna go save kate nelligan and everything's going to happen, but we don't get that. And it sounds like, Cam, that the, the, that was the intent in the, the longer version that will at least maybe show the helicopter flying over and landing. Mm-hmm. But it just felt like a string that got left behind and you get no real closure on it all. So it's like, well, did they just leave her with this two dead guys, three dead guys on the island and her kid? When are they going to show up and, and at least try to help her out? It's like they wanted to just end, I think, on that broken connection between her and yeah. Donald Sutherland and leave it between those two characters. But when you have that first hour that's very like plot focused, it's like it's a tough thing to cut loose and just ignore that stuff because the movie has made a point to accentuate it for a significant, you know, chunk of the runtime. Exactly. That that scene at the end though did provide something I'm very proud of and I intend to create a gif and put this online of Donald Sutherland just like face planting into the boat <laughs> oh yeah 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 that was great this is like Macintosh man levels of man diving into the water <laughs> this is this is my new like I can't deal with this anymore gif it's just like Donald Sutherland dying in a boat <laughs> yeah that was it was a great death and I like that he when she shot him he went down fast yeah 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 I, was, I like when he fell off the cliff yeah he really went for it um Cam what about you something you didn't like um, I think, you know, Christopher, uh, Casanova, I think Casanova, who played, uh, the husband, David, this character, he's a little too unbearable. Mm-hmm. Like there's a point where I kind of go like, okay, I can accept that this woman would be in an unhappy marriage. Like, you know, we, Scott, you referenced the 39 steps. I can understand how the crofter's wife is there. Mm-hmm. In this case, this guy seems actively miserable. Throughout every single encounter he has with anyone. My favorite moment was where he's just like with Don Sutherland and her. And he's like, well, I'm taking pills. I want to be out. And he just like knocks himself out on pills. But he's just always snapping at people. And I don't know. Like, I felt like it was a little too far. It just felt like this character was a little too unlikable. I wonder if that's direction or if that's acting. Like, I, 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 I struggle with that as well. Because I, I had a huge problem with him as well. Like, I felt like... There's that moment where they're in, where uh, Kate Nelligan and him are in bed together, and she's like, "Well, I need you," and you know, mm. trying to sort of win him back over, and he just instead of showing some level of you know deeper emotional thought, instead he's just like 
no. And he just sort of, you know, yeah. tucks further over um, in a very kind of almost corny way. Like it, like he could have done, he could have played that so much more, you know, like maybe he at least absorbed what she had to say a little bit instead of it being so just decidedly, I'm grumpy, I'm grouchy. You know what I mean? Yeah, like he came across as grouchy all the time, like instant grouch versus like, that makes sense to me if the character who's gone through this traumatic experience and is forever, you know, like wounded by this, if you at least have those moments where there's like a register of like acknowledging what she's saying, but he won't, he can't give into it. That would add a little more versus the guy that on a dime is just instant snapping at everyone. I, I definitely agree. And, and, you know, you, as an actor, I can imagine a lot of actors chomping at the bit to play a character who's like, was a proud soldier and lost the ability to do the thing he was proud of being lost his identity in an accident on his wedding day. There's so much emotion loaded with that and the, what the character should have been four years later living in Scotland. Instead, we just get this curmudgeonly bloke. But maybe that is just there to service the plot because he is not our lead character. What I would have liked to have seen from him is just maybe a little bit more of his army training. Now, he did find the photo reel of the, and, and the, the picture. So he had... He investigated. He was unsure, but he was unsure of the guy from day one. I would like to have maybe seen him more prodding Faber uh, to find more information out. Be like, I am suspicious of this guy. I don't know why. Something's clicking in my mind. Something feels off. I wanted maybe a teeny bit more of that before he loses his rack with him and tries to off him. And I also would like to know a little more about, like, clearly, you know, sparks are going between Donald Sutherland and Kate Nelligan, like, immediately. And I would like maybe a little acknowledgement that this guy, he's aware of it and he just doesn't care. Like, I think that would be interesting because I didn't know. The movie didn't really seem to come down on whether he was just oblivious or what. And I think it would make sense to me if he just genuinely didn't care. He's into it. <laughs> yeah, he's into it. <laughs> I wonder if that's a directorial decision as well, though. Maybe a sign of the times as well as a way to sort of make sure that people were on uh Kate Nelligan's side or Lucy's mm -hmm. Lucy's side is is oh we need to make this guy as unlikable as possible but in as a result of that you sort of forfeit a little deeper delve into who that person is. Instead instead you just make him completely unlikable and 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 so you end up losing something in the process as well. Well, and you also have to think with an unlikable character when Donald Sutherland offs him, you don't completely lose the empathy with with Faber's character by doing what he did because you can tell she's miserable with her husband and if you know obviously booting him over the side wasn't the way to address that issue, but um <laughs> because he was so unlikable, at least Faber remains sort of like a question mark in your head. Where is he going to go with this ultimately? At the end, is he going to just stay with her? Is he going to fulfill his mission? You don't instantly hate him for the last 20 some odd minutes of the movie because of what he did. Yeah, and and I mean, for me, in terms of the thing I had, the only gripe I had, I really want to dig into a little bit, is just that lack of a good guy, in a sense. Now, I know um, Lucy Rose, Kate Nelligan's character, is kind of the good guy in the film, as is, you know, uh, David Rose, the husband, uh, technically a good guy, though he's a bit of an asshole too. Is he um, a good guy? I don't know. I I mean, like he's hurt, but he's he's ultimately working for the Allies, I suppose. Like in terms of That's the true. balances of good and evil, in the sense of this film's moral compass. Sure. But um, no, I just w when we're looking at sort of perhaps more the procedural side and being chased, this uh, agent being chased across England, um. Also quite interesting to see uh, the islands of Scotland come back after the Spy in Black and the Orkney Islands. So uh, apparently spies like to hang out in the cold, wet islands of Scotland. I should uh, I should remotely podcast from there, I think. <laughs> um, no, but I, I just, you know, I mentioned Michael Lonsdale earlier. I, wa I wanted a character akin to that. This is post the Jackal, Day of the Jackal, sorry, not the, not the Jackal. 
Um, I would have liked to have seen a, 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 a someone who's chasing him on the same level or even close to the level. I don't think the character who's chasing him has a name. I think he's just called Lieutenant in the IMDb credits. I have no idea, yeah, who he was. It was just some rando dude. Um, he had a few lines of exposition and that was it. Like Michael Lonsdale's character in The Day of Jack had a had a family, had a life. Like you understood like the the search was taking you know, years off of his life. He was not sleeping and he was throughout the film deteriorating and losing his composure and then he's thrown off the case at the end and then he finally finally tracks the jackal down and shoots him. Like that's a nice little solving of the plot. You don't even actually get to see the lieutenant find the needle at the end. There's not even a, a culmination of that plot technically. Now you can extrapolate it in your own head. But I mean this film was running at 148 minutes, 100, no, one hour and 48 minutes for me, but why couldn't it have been one hour and 49 and we just see him come up and see the lifeless body of Needle and be like, England wins this time. <laughs> well, I, I made a note in the first hour where I was really questioning, and I, I haven't read the book, and um, you know, I, I was actually wondering initially if the book was like quite long and they were condensing it, but the book's actually not. It's about, I think, 350 pages or something like that. But I'm also wondering if like a lot of the stuff focusing on Needle is all just internal monologue where the movie is taking those extra steps to try to construct the world around him and these people who are hunting him, but without, there's probably not a lot on the page. So it feels like that's coming across in the movie where it's these very stock characters, because I'm just wondering if like they aren't really factoring into the narrative in the book because the book can just place you inside the head of the character. That might be one of those things too, where, yeah, like that's where you need somebody to come in and write some dialogue that sort of helps fill in that, those gaps, you know, where you can't just rely entirely on, on the book. You know, because sure, you're filling out the Needles character, but yeah, exactly what you said. You know, if it's all just what's going on inside his head, but you can't do that in a movie, it doesn't translate directly over. You've got to, you've got to build those other characters um, so that it translates. Because you could, within like the book, just putting it from his point of view, acknowledge that like, you know, things are closing in on him. Mm. Like you could easily do that. Yeah, th th it doesn't really feel like there's any... Because you say in the, in the Day of the Jackal, you feel the Jackal by the end when he's in Paris about to shoot at Charles de Gaulle. It feels like the walls are closing in on him. Th that He gets one shot and he misses and he doesn't hit the second shot because he's already been shot. Like There is set genuine tension in that moment when Lonsdale was charging up those stairs to him in the very last minutes. I didn't really feel that. I felt tension for uh, Kate Nelligan's character. Like, is she going to make it? Is the child going to make it? But I, I mean, obviously, we know history. This isn't going to try and change history. This is not a Quentin Tarantino film. <laughs> but we had no fear that the, that he was going to get that message to the Nazis. I, I, I didn't feel that tension, at least anyway. I wasn't too concerned about D-Day being disrupted. No, I think the more it was a concern of what was going to happen with Lucy and her son at the end, whether he was going to take him down with her or whatever else. And instead, they're going to go on a lovely picnic. <laughs> <laughs> mommy mommy <laughs> wait stick with that voice the whole episode cam it's, it's, it's far better than your usual voice I, um, I had a question for you guys do you think that the needle was in love with her no scott says no i think he's a i think he's a sociopath i think he's just acting i would agree with that as well i think maybe that's what he thinks he feels uh -huh. but he probably doesn't yeah He's probably not actually capable of feeling actual love. There's a moment where he feels like he is exposing a raw nerve where he's talking about his parents and like yeah, them right? not being happy with what they did. So they want to imprint on him. And he, from the sounds of like that bio they give him, the British intelligence people give him, that obviously he had quite a rough upbringing in the sense that he was like pushed into you know, private schools and didn't really see his parents, and like groomed by Hitler and things like that completely understand that but then that could all be a ruse maybe he loved his childhood that's also true um yeah it felt like he was revealing more to her than he ever would otherwise like this is a character who's been sealed off from people this entire mission that he's been taking part on i wasn't sure because like there seems to be like a kind of a sadness and regret 
to him at the end when he's being shot by her. And it's not just because he's not going to be able to deliver the photos. Um, because I think, like, it almost felt like he held back in some ways dealing with her. Like, I think when you look the way he dispatches people throughout the movie, he's pretty cold and ruthless. It felt like he didn't want to hurt her in the same way. So I don't want to say he's in love, but I think there is, like, maybe, like, a humanity he's connected to that he's not used to, you know, tapping into. <laughs> yeah. It could be It could be Donald Sutherland just looks naturally like a sociopath. <laughs> and that, that could That's be true. true. It could well be true. <laughs> One could argue that the fact that he didn't just walk in and kill all of them and then just got the radio and did what he needed to do indicates maybe his level level of sociopathy wasn't quite at the the maximum. So he could have some empathy in him because if he was just straight up, I got to finish the mission. Like, Oh, that's great soup. Stabby, 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 stabby. (laughs) Off you go Mm -hmm. over the cliff. And then there's nobody to stop him from doing what he needed to do. It makes a really bad movie, but you know, at the same time, if you're looking at analyzing where the character's coming from, there was some emotional attachment there. I don't know if it was love, but he certainly had a connection with her. And I think that's what ultimately caused his downfall because he couldn't just end her and complete the mission. He was at least in some way emotionally engaged with her on whatever level he was capable of being. Wasn't there a story too about when they're when they're sort of giving some of the exposition earlier in the movie there's a moment where they talk about his the history of his uh you know being a an agent for the for the nazis and how he had some sort of love affair with somebody yep and 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 i wonder if they could have played off that a little harder to make that almost as if that was his, that's his downfall. That's like his weakness or something. I don't know. Right. Because they said it was like a actress or something like that. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you guys asked like, is it, um, is it just Donald Sutherland? Maybe that's, that's coming through. And I was just looking at his IMDB and he was actually in the recent film Moonfall. So I can only assume there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of good people were in Moonfall, Scott. Sure. <laughs> Never forget. Sure. <laughs> Wasn't Halle Berry in Moonfall? Uh huh. I think Patrick Wilson. Yeah. Woof. Oh boy. Well, I think before we uh, tackle the knock list, let's just throw it around for any final thoughts. I had a note slash question. You mentioned the soup earlier. I I, I think Jason mentioned the soup. <laughs> now, when he walked in, he said he was starving, and he had a very small bowl of soup and then a very thin slice of bread. And then she offered him another bowl of soup. And he said, no, how bad was her cooking? (laughs) Bad enough that with every soup, half of the, every sip of the soup, half of the soup and the spoon (laughs) fell back in the bowl. Lovely. (laughs) (laughs) There was rationing going on, so maybe like a lot of the ingredients just weren't there. She's working with nothing. Well, there's a, a I, I will add to my argument. There's another scene where they're all eating dinner together, and they're scraping an entire <laughs> plate's worth a of food. Whole plate. Yeah. How bad is her cooking? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I'm surprised that the the husband. Maybe that's why the husband is so grumpy. That's why so <laughs> the cranky. food. <laughs> It's like four a, years of this. Uh, I hate Storm Island. It's all the food I get. No wonder I get drunk with Tom every day. Tom knows how to make a stew. Right? <laughs> <laughs> At least he seasons it. Uh, all right. Well, I, I suppose it wasn't really a question there. It was just a bit of a, a weird story. But thank you all for indulging me on the uh, the soup train. Uh, any, any final notes, folks? I'll throw it out. I have... Um couple things i wanted to bring up let's start with (laughs) the obvious one that really jumped out to me so off the top we see you know david um and lucy driving after their wedding and they are uh freewheeling it all over the road we see that crash and all that happens is he loses his legs i saw that car and this is a 1940s automobile flying off a cliff and i was like oh they survived (laughs) (laughs) 
Exactly. Like, there's no way. There's no way from the crash we saw, there's no way that she is intact and that like this thing didn't explode or something. Yeah. She she walked away without a scratch. <laughs> crazy i mean to be fair the shame of having your mother say to you do you know what has meant to happen tonight <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm not sure i would have recovered um it, i mean i'm getting I, so when this when this episode comes out i will be married like i at this time i'm not but i will be married mm. and uh hopefully uh well you know my partner's mother-in-law will be there hopefully she's not giving me that pep talk <laughs> no kidding <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think I'll ever live that down. But uh, yeah, an interesting choice with the car crash. Because they didn't have seatbelts then, I don't think, did they? Did they use them? No, not really. And that was a that was a, a classic Bentley as well. It's very nice. Yeah, car. like um, wow, that mm. uh, was quite a crash. Um, the other thing was just like there's the interesting use of sex scenes in this movie. I thought was actually really well handled. Where it's like bringing up the mother again, are you? Yeah, that's right. I'm going right, right from the mother-in-law. Um, but like, uh, they have the one that's like quite passionate, and I like that when you have the reveal that she realizes who he is, where they restage it very similarly, and it's all played out on her face of like the I need to go through this because he can't be aware that I know he's a spy. But it was like really interesting how it went from this kind of like '80s eroticism to just full-on chilling. I would I would echo that as well. Um, yeah, agreed. I commented a little earlier. It was the same thing. She sold it so well, her level of discomfort, and yet at the same time, she seemed like she was still enjoying it, which probably made her even more uncomfortable, and it, it reflected well in her performance. I feel like th there are a lot of movies that fail when that sort of moment happens, and and in this one, I felt real disgust as I was watching it, like watching her performance and how awful just absolutely awful she felt so yeah like that was actually a incredibly successful scene and i did not expect it to be so and the way that um the first time it ends with like um you know her head on his abdomen and then the second time it's his on hers and you get like that reaction of her just like staring basically into space looking like just terrified it's like a really good pivot kind of thing Smart directorial decision there. Yeah, you can see why he was uh, still popular afterwards. And, you know, Return of the Jedi is a pretty big film to get. I'm, I'm not sure that was the scene that got him the job, but... Well, you know, there's that deleted <laughs> scene from Return of the Jedi where Leia very gently lays her head on the Ewok's abdomen. Mm. And, then, and then later, <laughs> we see the Ewok laying his head on C-3PO's abdomen. And so... I, they cut it out for time, but there's definitely some parallels there. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of nub-nub in that scene. <laughs> Be chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right, I think we're spiraling here, folks. We are, we're definitely uh, careening off the side of a bridge. Um, I think it's knock list time. Um, but, Cam, as we have guests, just run us through what the knock list is. Yes, the knock list is our tortured acronym for need to see official classics of the Spy Hearts podcast, where every week after we've talked about a movie, we debate whether it belongs on the list of the all-time great spy films. So some films on that list include like North by Northwest, uh, Day of the Jackal Made It On, Goldfinger from Russia with Love. Um, it kind of runs the gamut. Zero Dark Thirty made it on the list. So it's open to all types of spy films, but that sort of sums up what the list is. So the question you get now, you both get a vote. There'll be four votes this week. Is Eye of the Needle making such a hallowed list? Let's go with Jason first. Yay or nay? Nay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> Ice cold like the uh, needle himself. <laughs> hey, I, I, that's fair enough. That's your vote. That's what you want to do with it. So that's one no so far. All to play for, Ben. I would say would not make the knock list. Um, even though, even though the last 30 minutes, uh, I actually think are really great of this movie. Um, because you have this, you know, bisected movie where for the first hour and probably hour and 20 minutes or so, it just, it's just such a slog and there, and there's no real, uh, hero or no real person sort of pursuing the needle and then it completely changes gear and that gear seems to work more successfully 
probably because of the cast. Um, but it's just, it's too long to wait for. And so for that reason, I would say it wouldn't make the list. It would not make the list. Okay. All right. Two no's, gents. That's fine. We can still sneak it on if we have to. Cam? Yeah, it's a no for me as well. This is the type of spy film where if you talk to people who've watched a lot of the great spy films, you say, oh, have you checked out Eye of the Needle? That's an interesting one you should check out. But it's not something where you'd say, you have to have seen Eye of the Needle to really get a firm grasp on the genre. It's just like a movie, I think, driven far more by performances than by overall spy storytelling. I think when it's trying to do that sort of down and dirty espionage stuff it comes up a bit wanting compared to some of the other things we've talked about that are on the list so yeah i enjoyed this film but it's a nay for me okay three no's so i'm pointless here as per um so i'm just going to speak from the heart really uh <laughs> it's it's interesting with this one um you know i'm a i'm a big fan of being uh, having water thrown all over me and doused with water i wear a lot of white t-shirts as well i'm, I'm really into that <laughs> No, um, it, it's a no. It's clearly a no. We've all we've all found things that we like to with this film, but I don't think it's good enough to be need to see, which is the N of the knock list. I mean, if you're a big fan of The Day of the Jackal, this is maybe some additional reading for you, something that gives you a little taste of it and gives you a little something else as well, but maybe doesn't quite scratch that itch as well as uh, Jackal did. Uh but the Jackal, Day of the Jackal, I should say, did make the knock list. And this, this is a lesser version of that. There's, it basically explains why it didn't make it in the first place. But if you like your Donald Sutherland spy films as well, maybe if you like The Eagle Has Landed, maybe a good, again, nice additional reading. Again, not knock list worthy. So, yeah, it's a no from me. And as such, that's four no's. Eye of the Needle is not making the knock list. And the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. But gentlemen ben jason the central intelligence cinema podcast thank you both for joining us thank you it's been thank fun. you well i mean let the listeners know there will be links in the show notes below for everyone wants to go check it out if you've gone through our catalog numerous times you want i want more spy movies they're the guys to go and see gents could you tell our listeners a little bit more about the show well i would have to say if uh, Dante and Randall from the movie Clerks decided to make a podcast about spy movies. Huh. You might get the Central Intelligence Cinema. I think uh, we're the we're the type of guys that are wondering: Did they get independent contractors to work on that space station? Um, <laughs> and we do when we cover movies. We we tend to go pretty in depth on on scenes and and how how things are constructed. Um, perhaps too granular occasionally. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but uh... especially with bond movies, we tend to go overboard on, on our, on our uh, coverage. We, we tend to get a little bit play by play, but uh, we also, I will say we cover, um, we're starting to cover um, comic books as well, because we are the podcast that covers spy movies and secret agent pop culture. And so we're trying to, you know, um, cover some of that other stuff. We occasionally um, review TV shows. Um, we did an Ale we did Alex Ryder season one. We covered that one, um, and I know that we're probably going to cover the old man soon. Jason, do you have anything to add? Have I missed anything? No, we're really just kind of a potpourri of of different spy type of things with movies as more or less the focus. Um, you know, we we started off with the idea of a review show. Um, but I think it's expanded into a little bit more than just reviews, you know, because we'll try and throw relevant uh, information out there for upcoming movies, TV shows, comic books, even toys and things like that, um, that we kind of feel would appeal to people that are listening. So, you know, if, if it's I think it's an excellent podcast for people who are more like me, who are more spy adjacent in some cases, they they like the genre, but not necessarily love the genre. But um, it's a it's accessible in a way that maybe a James Bond focused or a Mission Impossible focused would be like your show. It it it, it takes the breadth of the cinematic spy uh, genre out there and and brings it all in one at a time for everyone to be able to listen to. Yes, and I would say too that um, we tend to um, 
I think I saw, I, I think it's safe to say we take the piss out of a lot of movies. Um, but that's not necessarily because we dislike them. It's just kind of what we do. Um, a lot of times we really love the movies. And even some of the movies that we don't review all too favorably, uh, by the end of the by the end of the review, I, I tend to find myself actually kind of liking some of those. Yeah, well, it, it's important to remember that the fact that a film is made is something to be celebrated mm-hmm. as a start. Right. It, regardless of whether it's a terrible film, the fact that it got screened in front of people in a cinema is something to be celebrated. So it's always good to find something you like with films. And um, yeah, I mean, we we rib most films that we tackle as well. So in the same vein as well. So I definitely recommend. And where can people find you online? Uh, well, on Twitter, you can go at CIC Spy Pod. Um, on Instagram, it's just uh, Central Intelligence Cinema, uh, separated by underscores. And on our email, you could reach us at CIC uh, Dead Drop at gmail.com. And then otherwise, um, just uh, we're on Apple uh, Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on all most of the major uh, outlets. Perfect. Well, I mean, you'll see Central Intelligence Cinema on our podcast feed, obviously, when you hear this episode, but you'll also see them on all our social medias this week. We'll be tagging them in a ton of stuff. So just find them through there if you can't find it anywhere else and uh, get subscribed, I say. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. And thank you for, I mean, we uh, we could talk about Goldfinger every week and I think we would all get bored. So I like to find these different mm-hmm. films. And our goal is to find and talk about every single spy film ever made and find out if it made a knock list. So thank you for joining us for the first time because you will be back. Thanks. Thank you. Well, there you go, folks. That was Ben and Jason from the Central Intelligence Cinema podcast. But Cam, the question is, what are we doing next week? A little bit of a change of pace, Scott. We are tackling, I think, our first full-on martial arts film. We are going to look at the 2001 Jet Li vehicle, Kiss of the Dragon. I'm a big Jet Li fan, but I can't say this is one I think I've ever actually seen. So the idea of having a martial arts film with a spy plot running throughout sounds fantastic and very exciting. And... To accompany the review, we'll be chatting to the director, Mr. Chris Nahon himself, later in the week. So stick around for that, too. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I have seen Kissing the Dragon a few times, and it's been a long time, so I'm looking forward to revisiting it. Well, there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to check out Kiss of the Dragon and join us next week. If you like what you hear on Spy Hards, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. It just helps us share the Spy Hard love. And speaking of, do not forget to contact us discreetly on social media at S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But Cam, until next week, I've kept some meat pie warm just for you.